Welcome to Word Pictures, a program of discussion and discovery. We examine the stories, events, and persons as described in the Word Pictures, presented in the 66 books of Scripture we know as the Word of God. But what kind of God is pictured here? By reading these stories, some become fearful, others adore. Yet others are just confused. Come, let us see for ourselves in an unrehearsed, no question barred discussion with people just like you as we search for the God of these stories. What picture of God will emerge for you? Let's join the discussion right now. Welcome to our discussion. Once again, we're so glad that you have joined us. If you've been with us in the last few sessions, you know that we've been studying the life of Christ, looking at various uh, uh, things that he did and places that he went. Uh, we are to the place where he had gone down to Jerusalem and challenged the authority of the Pharisees, challenged their view of Sabbath observance by healing the uh, lame man of 38 years there at the Pool of Bethesda. And this caused a lot of problems. They were very upset with him. So they wanted, what, to, what, they wanted to kill him. They wanted to kill him. So what did he do in that environment? Well, that's a good question because just about exactly that same time, John the Baptist was arrested by King Herod. Mm -hmm. So things were getting really very uncomfortable for Jesus and John and so forth at that point in time. So Jesus decided it was time for him to move his ministry to Galilee. And there's a very interesting occurrence. We have been, you know, in our last session, if you saw us last time, it was all about the first three or four chapters in the Gospel of John. Well, if you look at the end of chapter five, you go down and Jesus is talking to the, Sadducees, to the Pharisees primarily. And verse 20, 47 says, but since you do not believe what he wrote, how can you believe what I say? That's the end of his discussion with them. And remember that in the, in the original, there's no chapter divisions, there's no verse divisions. It goes right on and says, after this, Jesus went across Lake Galilee, or Lake Tiberias, that is so called, and a large crowd followed him, etc. Um, when did that happen? A year later. Now we're trying to go through the life of Christ chronologically. Most of the books of Matthew, Mark, and Luke happened between the end of John 5 and the beginning of John 6. There's a whole year that happens and John doesn't mention it at all. So we're not going to leave John and we're going to go to Matthew, Mark, and Luke and we're going to see what happened in the Galilean years, the year of, of Jesus' ministry, the time when he really focused on Galilee. And where does that take us? Well, look at Luke 4. That'll be the best place to talk about how his ministry began in, in, in Galilee. We told you last time, if you were listening, that Jesus had left Jerusalem. He passed through Samaria. He talked to the woman at the well of Sychar. He was on his way to where? His hometown, of Nazareth. Nazareth. And now we pick up with the story of Luke, with the Gospel of Luke, chapter 4. Jesus returned from the Jordan full of the Holy Spirit. Now it's been talking, mentioning his baptism. where He was tempted by the devil 40 days and so forth and, and, and dropped down, come down uh, to verse 14. Then Jesus returned to Galilee and the power of the Holy Spirit was with him. The news about him spread throughout all that territory. He taught in the synagogues and was praised by everyone. So Luke just throws in a sort of introductory sentence or so there talking about the fact that Jesus is back in, in Galilee and he goes to his hometown, Nazareth. And so what happened? Went to the well, synagogue. his well, custom was he went to the synagogue. On the Sabbath, as his custom was, he went to the synagogue. The person in charge stood up and read from the scriptures and gave a talk and at the end of that brief time, Jesus stood up and said, I would like to say something. And they said, it's customary for visiting rabbis or even rabbis who are around in the area. If they want to say something, that's fine. If you're recognized as a rabbi, and he was, there are people following him now. Speak on, man. And what happened? He read something from Isaiah, Isaiah 60, verses 1 and 2. And they love that verse. And if you can read it, maybe we should read it just to sort of get the picture here. 
Isaiah 60, the first couple of verses. Arise, Jerusalem, and shine like the sun. The glory of the Lord is shining on you. Our other nations will be covered with darkness. I, I'm sorry. 61. We want to go to 61. I just recognize. 60, Isaiah 61. The sovereign Lord has filled me with his spirit. He has chosen me and sent me to bring good news to the poor. And they recognize this as what kind of a Old Testament passage? Messianic. A messianic prophecy, right? So they, they're, they're rooting and shouting, and not shouting, but saying, go, preach, preach, okay? To bring good news to the poor, to heal the brokenhearted, to announce release to captives and freedom to those in prison. They said, yeah, we know what the Messiah is going to do. He has sent me to proclaim that the time has come when the Lord will save his people. And he stopped there. And what does the next sentence say? The part of the thing that they liked, because, I mean, you know, he, bring good news to the poor, that, that didn't really fit very well with their, with their gospel, so forth like this. They liked the last part of verse 2, and defeat their enemies. Right? And Jesus left that part out. Why do you suppose he left that part out? Because they were confused. <laughs> he was stirring the pot. He was stirring the pot? <clears throat> yeah. But leaving it out was one thing. Mm -hmm. But saying that this day scripture is fulfilled in your ears, that was something else. Yes. What in effect is he saying? I am he. I am he. Right. He didn't say it, just right. plain out. But he's saying, if you know what this prophecy in the Old Testament is about, you will recognize that I am claiming to be the Messiah. Here in church on Sabbath. Here in church on Sabbath in my hometown. Now we need to understand a couple of things when, before, when we talk about the claims of Jesus. What was the broadest claim? Oh, when I say broadest, I mean the most general claim that Jesus made about who he was. The Son of God. Well, no, that's the, that's, the, that's the typical. The broader claim is back before that. The broader claim is, I'm a descendant of David, a son of David. Now, there were a lot of people who were descendants of David. But that meant that if you were a descendant of David, at least theoretically, you were in line to do what? Be the Messiah. Be the Messiah, be the Messiah or potentially be a king, right? You were in the Messianic, Davidic king line. Descendant of the tribe of Judah, right? Then the next thing, more narrow than that, would be a Messiah. Not just a descendant of David, but the anointed one. See? Now, the Jews expected someone to come and be anointed. What kind of people were anointed? Leaders. Prophets. Leaders. Kings were anointed. Priests were anointed. Those are the main groups. We're talking about leaders. People in very high positions were the ones who got anointed. Now the Messiah was the anointed one, the anointed one, not an anointed one, the anointed one. Okay? That's what the name Christ, that's what the name Messiah means. So Jesus said, I am the one. And what was their response? Stone him. They just kept looking at him, didn't they? Well, in that they, particular case, you mean? They knew who he was. He'd grown up there. Yeah. You mean, <laughs> you're the guy that made our chairs and fixed our walls and put on our roofs, and now you're trying to claim you're the Messiah? I mean, give us a break. We know you better than that, right? Why did he go back to Nazareth to do this? Verily I say unto you, no prophet is accepted in his own country. Why is that? Because they knew of his carpentry skills. Familiarity breeds contempt. Familiarity breeds contempt. Don't you, don't you think they recognized, surely they recognized, this wicked city of Nazareth. And here's the only person who has ever lived in our world who never committed a sin from beginning to the end of his life. He had lived in that town for essentially 30 years. They had to recognize that he wasn't just like every other person in town. 
you think Jesus ever went to the synagogue and read the scriptures before that or stood up to say anything prior to this or was this the first time? Well, he was probably younger than 30 before that and was, was someone younger than 30 allowed not to? Not supposed to preach, not supposed to teach. At the end of that message though, of what he read, they all bear him witness and wondered at the gracious words which proceeded out of his mouth. Mm -hmm. Then they said, is not this Joseph's son? Mm -hmm. But then he told three stories mm -hmm. that really set him on edge. Yeah, what were that? What were those stories? Well, he said... Uh, he talked about Elijah going, going to, to the, the widow, widow of Zarephath. Zarephath. Where was where is Zarephath? Not mm. in Israel. And Tyre, right between Tyre and Sidon. Okay? And he talked about the Naaman, lepers. the leper, right? Assyria Where was Naaman from? Assyria. He was from Assyria. He was from Nineveh, that wicked city of Nineveh. And? And the, and the lepers that were healed in Israel. Yeah, yeah. And what did they say? And all day in the synagogue, when they heard these things, yeah. were filled with wrath. And they rose up and thrust him out of the city and led him to the brow of a hill where whereon their city was built, that they might cast him down headlong. Mm -hmm. His friends, theoretically, the people who knew him best, the people from his own town, just because he made a claim like this, were ready to kill him. What does that tell you? About God, about the devil, about people's prejudices, about their thinking, Prejudices are a very powerful force. If you start messing with people's ideas, look out. Especially if you attack their most cherished ideas. You better, you better be very careful. And that's what his whole life was about. Mm -hmm. The whole purpose of his coming down was to correct their ideas. Sure. So he in, in, in hopefully in subtle but, but not sometimes not so subtle in very gentle ways his whole purpose in life was to change people's thinking imagine that so what does that say about God yeah it says God wants us to know the truth about him and he'll stoop to any length to make it happen and maybe we don't have all the answers right come on Myra how could you say such a thing I don't know Slip we don't have all the answers? It's a good thing we have all the answers now, though. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Or do we? Well, uh, what did then Jesus, what's the question? What answers don't we have? What did Jesus do next? He moved. He took his mother, and they moved to Capernaum. But he miraculously disappeared from that group. Yeah. With, yeah. And, That's right. And then he moved. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know whether they came after him as he was moving or whatever. We don't told that, but he moved to Capernaum. Who else lived in Capernaum? I think Peter lived there, didn't he? Peter and Andrew. James and John lived not very far away. It's possible that James and John were actually cousins of Jesus. Well, so Jesus said, okay, now I've come to the time when I need to, I, I really need to get on with teaching my disciples. And um, look, turn now to Luke 5. And let's read the first uh, few verses here. One day Jesus was standing on the shore of Lake Gennesaret. Gennesaret, that's another name for, for Galilee. While the people pushed their way up to him to listen to the word of God. He saw two boats pulled up on the beach. The fishermen left them and wa were washing their nets. Jesus got into one of the boats that belonged to Simon and asked him to push off a little from the shore. Jesus sat in the boat and taught the crowd. When he finished speaking, he said to Simon, push the boat out further to the deep water and you and your partners let down your nets for a catch. Now, what's wrong with this picture? He's messing with... <laughs> with the way they know how to fish. These guys were professional fishermen. They had been fishing since they were young. 
they knew this. And when do you go fishing? At night. And why do you fish at night? So the fish don't see. You, in those days, they had big old, big old nets that were made out of rope. There was none of this nylon stuff or netting, finding that kind of stuff we'd have today. Big old thick stuff, so you, try, you fish at night so the fish can't see. The, you let down the net, and they, hopefully the fish will swim across, and then you pull the net up quickly around the edges, and you, you, you catch the fish that are in the middle. And now there's a carpenter standing in a boat, and they have fished on, well, this, we don't know how long, but basically they, they, their nets were empty, the boat wasn't empty. Jesus says, pull out there a little ways and let down your nets. And they're saying, oh no. <laughs> what, what, what is this carpenter trying to do? But did they obey him? They obeyed him. They obeyed him. Just because he said so. Even though it seemed completely foolish. Yeah, it says in verse 5, Master, Simon said, we worked hard all night long and caught nothing. Yes. But if you say so, I will let down the nets. Mm -hmm. Isn't that the equivalent of, you said it, I believe it, that's all there is to it. Let down the nets, boys. Okay. Well, let's think about that. What does this say about God? Well, l let's just think about it for a moment. If you're sure... God is speaking, you better pay attention. If you're sure God is speaking, you better pay attention, even if he asks you to do something crazy. How can we be sure that it's God speaking? Well, that's, we're going to talk, what things we're going to What kind of evidence did they, did they have for believing that Jesus was certainly more than an ordinary human being? They had watched all these miracles that he had done. They had watched a they number of miracles. Teach. Yeah. They had heard him teach. teach. They had heard his sermons. They had heard his claims. They hoped that he was the Messiah. They wanted it to be true. They called him master. Yes. Teacher. Yeah. yeah. But Rabbi. Somebody with authority. Yeah. Okay. So what happened? Obviously, the carpenter didn't know anything about fishing, right? He may not know anything about fishing, but he knew how to fill the net. <laughs> so they motioned to their partners in the other boat to come and help. Uh, I'm sorry. Uh, verse 6. They let them down and caught such a large... This is the middle of the day, or toward the end of the day. Bright daylight. Caught such a large number of fish that the nets were about to break. So they motioned their partners in the other boat to come and help them. They came and filled both boats so full of fish that the boats were about to sink. When Simon Peter saw what had happened, he fell on his knees before Jesus and said, Go away from me, Lord, I am a sinful man. What kind of a response is that? Appropriate. <coughs> that's, the re that's, that's the response of anybody who comes into contact with God. I mean, the prophets, Christ shows up, an angel shows up, nose in the face, nose face in the in dirt, the dirt. Okay. face in the dirt. And that's what Peter's doing here. He, he recognized as a fisherman all his life that this was an absolute miracle. And, and what else does it show us? I mean, it's just a miracle, but when we're so used to talking about these things that maybe we don't, we don't think about this. Jesus has just proved that he can control everything in nature. How do you, I mean, have any of you tried to uh, force a fish to get on the end of your hook? Couple of times. Yeah. <laughs> How well did it work? Not bad here and there. <laughs> Every once in a while, you're lucky, huh? <laughs> Have you ever put a net down and tried to tell the fish, "Come on over here"? We don't even try. We wouldn't think of it because, because we can't. And Peter recognizes here's a fisherman who spent his entire life so far, basically. Fishing on that lake, he knew what the conditions were. He knew that Jesus had told him to do everything wrong. And what happens? His nets are breaking and his boat is sinking. Yes. So if we see someone perform a miracle, are we to believe that that is God? Are we to follow that person, believe them, and trust them? Okay, well, if you can be, and, and this is the question, now we, do, we, we need to be sure this God acting. 
So that's the first thing we need to know. If we can be sure it's God acting, then the answer is yes. And, and how do we go about deciding whether it's God acting or not? By their fruits you should know them. But there's, there's more to it than that. Uh, um, when Jesus performed a miracle, there, he always ended up saying something afterwards. Talked and talked with people and made so forth like this. What did he do in this case? Do you remember? Follow me. He said, I'll make you fishers of men. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, he told them. A little while later, he told them to follow him. And, and, and Jesus is just, I mean, they had seen enough already. They knew that this, was, this guy was genuine. You, you, don't, you don't heal people who've been paralyzed for 38 years. You know, you don't do all these kind of things. There, this man was just completely breaking down every notion they had of, of, of you know. But, but the, the, one of the rules that we're given is to the law and to the testimony. Yeah. If they don't speak that way, there's no light in them. And here was Jesus. He had been quoting the Old Testament, performing these miracles, revamping how they thought about the Old Testament and what, and what it was saying. And it was certainly to the law and to the testimonies. Is, is, so they had good reason to, to believe it. This weekend, I heard a Bible discussion on the, on the test. You know, by, by their fruits you shall know them. And uh, an explanation was given, which I've, which I've heard, uh, which I, it sort of slipped my mind, but it was nice to, to have it refreshed. It's not by what they do, but it's what their followers or adherents do. Mm -hmm. It's by their fruits. Do their disciples bear fruit? Yes. You know. Um, well, I've heard another version of that story is you can tell a pastor is doing a good job not by how many people he brings into the church, but by how many people are brought into the church by the people he brought into the church. That's a, that's a tough test. <laughs> well, I can tell you about a pastor I met one time who, was, who actually came to one the place where I was working and was giving a seminar for pastors. And when he was a young man, had just not even married yet, had just graduated from theological training, the, the leader of the church organization there sent him to place to work with another pastor there. And, uh, and it wasn't an easy place to work. He worked as a youth pastor with this guy for one year. And then the leader, the church leader, the conference president came to him and said, I'm sending you to a place, to a city where there's not any Adventists at all. When you, have con when you have converted a church, when, you, when you've established a church with at least 200 members attending and you've built a church building and it's paid for, we'll ordain you. Mm -hmm. And that took him about, I think, five years. So um, sometimes that kind of thing happens. Well, so what happens next? And we're going this story. Immediately follow that, following that, we go to, to uh, Luke 4, um, and, I mean, sorry, Luke 5 to verse 12. Once Jesus was in a town where there was a man who was suffering from a dread. I'm sorry, I want, I want to go somewhere else first. Let's go to uh, Mark 1, verse 21. We're trying to go through the, the, the stories here chronologically. Mark, what? Mark 1, okay. starting with 21. Okay. Jesus and his disciples came to the town of Capernaum. Remember I just mentioned that when he was rejected in Nazareth, what did he do? He okay. moved to Capernaum. And he's now, his first experience was there with the disciples. I mean, with, with, the, with the fishermen and so forth. And, the thing. and so now he's in Capernaum. Um, and on the next Sabbath, Jesus went to the synagogue and began to teach. The people who heard him were amazed at the way he taught, for he wasn't like the teachers of the law, and studied he taught with authority. Compare the authority with whatever it is, the way the scribes and yes. lawyers, how did they teach? Okay, when the, when the Pharisees and the scribes taught, their authority 
with quotation marks around it, was the fathers, the ancient fathers or the, or the uh, authorities. Previous uh, rabbis? Previous rabbis, uh, a group known as the Great Synagogue. These were the people, and there were two large schools, but there were many variations within those schools. So the idea is you would try to quote from the from an authority that you thought would, that was the best. So you would quote this person, and then if someone raised a question, might quote from somebody from the other side and back and forth, and you would quote from these authorities, and they didn't always, they often disagreed, and so you're quoting all these things, and the crowd is just going, you know, where where is this taking us? That's what they did. So it was a big, huge theological discussion that the people listening couldn't understand. They didn't, they didn't, they couldn't follow all this stuff. And Jesus used simple illustrations, things that everybody knew about, and the, the points that he made were so obviously true, there was no argument. He spoke with authority. Mm -hmm. What can you say? Yeah, what can you say? So, so that's what it means when it says the people who heard him were amazed at the way he taught, for he wasn't like the teachers of the law. Instead, he taught with authority. Yeah, that's what so it he means. Thought, taught with clarity. Yes, and, and uh, at a level that everybody could understand. Mm -hmm. Just then, a man with an evil spirit came into the synagogue and screamed, What do you want with us, Jesus of Nazareth? Are you here to destroy us? I know who you are. You are God's holy messenger. What is going on here? trying to break up the service. Devil is trying to break up the service, absolutely. Disturb things, get people, you know, shaken up and so forth, and forgetting what Jesus had said, right? And what did Jesus do? Made lemonade out. Didn't that devil expect to get thrown out? Didn't he know he was running into a, a, well, a problem that he couldn't maybe, deal with? Maybe he thought that he could he could get away with this somehow or other. But if the devil says the truth, you're the son of God, maybe he thought he would get away with it. And maybe he thought that, you know, I, I, I as the devil or I as one possessed can say this is God. It's true. Yeah. And people won't believe it because of the source that it's coming from. So Jesus is... It, the devil here is trying to disrupt things. I think that's pretty clear. And he's making a statement. Do you think he made this statement because in God's presence he can't avoid telling the truth? That would be one possibility. Or is it the other possibility Gordon has suggested? Because of the source, because of who's saying it, the people might have said, well, look, you know, maybe Jesus is in cahoots with these devils. You know? Or do you think it was more like Balaam? Well, it could have been that too. Yeah, it could have been that too. Um, and what does that tell us about God as we wind okay. up the segment? Yeah. Well, clearly, we need to see what Jesus just said. What? Be quiet and come out of the man. And Jesus cast out the evil spirit. And this is a man that everybody knew, I'm sure. He was there around that area. He had disrupted things before, and now suddenly he's completely calm and peaceful. And what does that say? Once again, God has power now over evil spirits. He controls nature, he controls disease, he controls, you know, now the devils, right? This should say something. People are beginning to see, you know, this guy is really amazing. But we're going to pick up the next story when we come back, so don't go away.
Welcome back. We're so glad you decided to stay by. We're going to move now to the next thing chronologically, or we're going to skip a little bit, but the next major thing chronologically in um, the, the, sto the, the life and the ministry of Jesus, and that's found in, in Mark 1, verses 40 to 45. Move down a few verses. A man suffering from a dreaded skin disease came to Jesus, knelt down, and begged him for help. If you want to, he said, you can make me clean. Now, the traditional translations call him a leper. It's very likely that was the case. We don't, from the descriptions we have of leprosy in the Bible, it's not clear that, that that's leprosy as we know it today. Maybe it is. We, we can't be absolutely sure. But what did they think about leprosy? What was their idea about leprosy? And you got it because you were had sinned. sinned somewhere or your parents had sinned or somebody's done something wrong. It was wrong. called the finger of God. I mean, you, you have done something so terrible that God has just placed a curse on you. Now, where would they get that idea? Is that from, mm -hmm. from the Old Testament, from Moses and possibly Aaron and, and Possibly their interpretation of some of the Old Testament. When More likely, they got it from other people around them who had this idea in other areas. As, God, as a sign of God's displeasure, didn't Moses, didn't uh, Aaron Miriam and Miriam get, get a dreaded with, skin yes. disease? Yeah. Well, it, it's the it's the prosperity gospel only on the on the negative side. Yeah. Yeah. Well, there also, for some reason, it seems to be within the national the natural instinct of human beings that when some misfortune befalls you or some disaster. If it's really painful, if you're really in desperate circumstances, you have a tendency to look around and blame it on God. Okay, but Why now me? let's 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 what? what? Why me? Yeah, Let, let's follow through with the story. We're not for, done yet. What was their belief about leprosy? Thank you. And what do they what did they say? What what happened to the people who had it? Outcast. They were they were seen, for, checked at first by the by the priests, and if they were declared to be leprous, they had to live. They were supposed to stay at least forty feet, as my understanding is. The measurements are a little different, but quite a distance. They were supposed to stay quite a distance from any other healthy person. They were supposed to stay away, because if a healthy person touched you, it was possible that they could get. The disease, right? Think, yeah. We know today that you get leprosy in your first 20 years of life, and you get it by intimate contact with somebody else over, over a considerable period of time with somebody else who has it. You don't get it by touching them. You know, that's, that's, that's a modern medical understanding of leprosy. But of course, these, these approaches to this disease, that you know, it's back yeah. over here. These are the instructions that God gave them to deal with. Yeah, these things. yeah exactly. So what did Jesus do? He said, back off, stay away at least 40 feet. Jesus was filled with pity and reached out and touched him. Oh dear, now Jesus is contaminated, right? That's forbidden. Yes. Isn't Jesus completely contaminated now? He's touching lepers. Did he know that? He wasn't in any danger because of what you had just explained here. You've got to get it in the first 20 years of constant and intimate contact. So, what do you mean, make me unclean? He doesn't have leprosy. Yeah. The second Jesus touched him, he didn't have leprosy anymore. That's right. Yeah. So, was Jesus contaminated or not, even according to their definition? I don't think so. <laughs> You know, the poor Pharisees, they were looking, there were spies there waiting for, you know, they just saw him. You know, you can see their eyes getting this big as they watch Jesus touch this, this leper and they say, we've got him. He's contaminated. He's, he's disobeying the rules. Except the guy doesn't have leprosy anymore. Wow. Jesus said, I do want to, he answered, be clean. At once. The disease left the man and he was clean. Then Jesus spoke sternly to him and sent him away at once after saying to him, listen, don't tell anyone about this. Why would Jesus say that? Read on. Probably because he knew he was talking to somebody like Peter that couldn't keep it in to himself. He said, but go straight to the priest and let him examine you. Then in order to prove to everyone that you are cured, offer the sacrifice that Moses offered. So what did you have to do to be declared clean? 
priest had to go get okayed by the priest. If the priest has to look at you, you, know, you look you fine, you look okay to me. Who was an authority on making a proper examination. Yes. And if the priest heard that Jesus had done this, <clears throat> he might have given a false diagnosis. Mm -hmm. The priest might have given a false diagnosis. Yeah. He might have refused to declare the man clean just because he so knew it was Jesus. why did Jesus tell him not to say anything to anybody? Because he's on the way to the temple. He's on the way but immediately if, to the temple but if before the anyone else gets the word that, you, that I've dealt with you. Okay. And when he's met with the priest, and the priest validates. No one else can validate this any more than the priest. The yep. priest has validated what Jesus has done here. Yes, exactly. But the man went away and began to spread the news everywhere. Indeed, he talked so much that he just could not go into a town publicly. Instead, he stayed out in lonely places and people came to him from everywhere. Jesus is basically just starting his Galilean ministry. And what's happened? He can't, even, he can't even enter a, a village. They're mobbing him. They're mobbing him. And who especially would be mobbing him under these circumstances? Anybody the lepers. Sick. Lepers. Mm -hmm. Anybody who's sick with any kind of disease. And so who comes next? The, par the paralytic. Remember, this man was so sick that his friends thought he's on, the, uh, he's on the verge of death. They, four of them, got him, carried him in a blanket, basically, from a long distance away to where they heard Jesus was. Uh, there's pretty good evidence to suggest that Jesus was in Peter's house in Capernaum. And what did they find when they got there? Jam-packed. Jam-packed. You could not get in the door. You couldn't get even close to where Jesus was. So what did he do? What did they do? They opened up, opened gave him a skylight. <laughs> made a skylight. Get okay. a sky like that. <laughs> well, the houses in that part of the world are made with flat roofs because that's the coolest, often that's the coolest place to go to sleep at night. So they climbed up on the roof, tore apart whatever was up there, I don't know for sure, enough space so they could let this man down right in front of Jesus. Do we have any information about this man? I mean, had he fallen and becoming, you know, broke his neck, or had he no. been this way for you? We don't have any information. No, not as far as I know. Ellen White Just says it. it was his idea yeah. to go he, he up. Wanted, he, he asked for them to take him to Jesus. He recognized, after what the leper had said, I'm sure, he recognized that his only chance of any healing was with Jesus. So here he is. And Jesus lets him down in front of, I mean, they let him down in front of Jesus. And what happens? Jesus, I think Jesus loved it. Jesus was like, wow, this is great. You have great faith. I think he, in my uh, version, he even called him son. Mm -hmm. He said, okay, you're, you're healed, son. Seeing how much faith they had, the people who brought the man, Jesus said to the paralyzed man, My son, your sins are forgiven. Aha, so it is the sins that are the problem. Yeah. Okay, Sorry. but there's more going on here than what immediately meets the eye. What's going on here? Well, he's, he had to meet well read, where they were. read the next couple of verses. Some teachers of the law who were sitting there thought to themselves, thought to themselves inside their heads, and they haven't said anything. How does he dare talk like this? This is blasphemy. God is the only one who can forgive sins. Right? Yeah, we'd agree, right? Sure. Yeah. Sure. Right. So what did Jesus do? At once Jesus knew what they were thinking. So he said to them, why do you think, think such things? What is he proving? He can read their mind. He can read their thoughts. They're drawing the right conclusions. <laughs> okay. Why do you think such things? Is it easier to say to this paralyzed man? Now, you need to understand their thinking. We've talked about it already a couple of times. What was their thinking? He's sick because he's a sinner. If you're good, you'll be blessed. If you're blessed, you'll be rich. But if you're bad, what happens? Some awful thing. What? It's a sign that yeah. you're not, not in the right Some way. awful thing is going to happen to you. And this, so, this was not a casual belief. This was, no. this was this a way was of life. Rooted. This is the way it is. You had to be rich to be a Pharisee mm -hmm. because it, took almost, it was almost a full-time job to just to practice your religion. So obviously, they felt they were layers and layers and layers above everybody else. 
I mean, what else could you conclude? I mean, right? We all know the Pharisees were way up there ahead of everybody else. So, by contrast, this terrible sinner, you know, stand back, don't even touch this guy, right? And Jesus blasphemes according to their thinking. But no, now there's a problem. I not have read the book of Job because mm -hmm. the book of Job contramands that viewpoint. Yes. Well, I, Jesus says, your sins are forgiven. Is it easier to say to this paralyzed man, your sins are forgiven, or to say, get up, pick up your mat, and walk? Now, their idea was he was sick because what? He was a sinner. He was a sinner. So is it different to say your sins are forgiven, or is it different to say... I mean, what's the difference between saying your sins are forgiven and saying, get up and walk? If you're healing the guy, what are you saying? Your sins are forgiven, right? Yeah. Well, the difference is you're creating a bigger stir. <laughs> <laughs> so what happened? I will prove to you then that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins. So he said to the paralyzed man, I tell you, get up, pick up your mat, and go home. Now, by those words and by this position that he's taking, doesn't he validate their, their, their proposition here? Well, he's speaking to them where they are. He's using their notions to catch them. His issue isn't with that belief. No. His issue is that they don't believe in him. Yeah, exactly. But he's using, you know, you can't, if he had said something that would be appropriate maybe for us, but wouldn't have any meaning to them. So why is it so important that they believe in him? Well, how, how are you going to get, remember we, we suggested that Jesus' purpose for coming here to this earth was to change people's ideas, but change their thinking. How are you going to get them, to, how are you going to get them to change their thinking if they don't believe in you? Changing their thinking on something as fundamental yeah. as who is God? What is God like? Yes. Very fundamental. Yes. Well, while they all watched, the man got up, picked up his mat, and hurried away. They were all completely amazed and praised God, probably not the Pharisees, <laughs> saying, we have never seen anything like this. They were so crowded he couldn't get in there, but he picked up his mat and walked out, and they made room. Yep. Yeah. When it says in verse 10, I will prove to you then that, I, that the Son of Man has authority, was he claiming to be, did they understand that, to be, that he was claiming to be God, or is it something else? What do you think? I think They that, said, yeah. they absolutely believed, they had declared that they believed in their thoughts now that Jesus read, only God has the power to forgive sins. So their, their, that was equivalent to saying in their thinking, only God can heal this person. It's because he had tried to get healed lots of times before. Probably he had been to some of those same Pharisees and priests and others to say, can you heal me? The answer is no. Only God can. They probably told the man himself, yeah, only God yeah. can heal you. Was he so, trying to prove that? I mean, obviously, he was trying to prove that he was God, but mm -hmm. they'd seen all these miracles, and it was just magic. Mm -hmm. Now he's saying, this is more than magic. I am God. I am. Well, what, what does the evidence suggest? Mm -hmm. They, in their own thinking, had said, only God can do this. And Jesus did it right in front of their eyes. It seems almost like he's overtly saying this as yes. opposed to by his actions, by just his actions saying that he was God. Mm -hmm. And yet we've talked several times before that, you know, Jesus many times didn't say that he was God other than to the non-Jews. Mm -hmm. Well, what happens next? Jesus is doing all sorts of completely crazy things. I mean, the people must have... The disciples, the disciples hadn't even been called yet to follow him. We haven't got to the official call of the disciples yet. But every morning they must have woken up and saying, what in the world is going to happen today? <laughs> right? Yep. Yeah. Well, this is, this is not what they expected, I'm sure. Look at starting at Mark 2, starting with verse 13. Jesus went back again to the shore of Lake Galilee. Yeah, Peter's home is a few, few maybe... 100 feet or something from the shore of Galilee. 
a crowd came to him and he started teaching them. As he walked along, he saw a tax collector, Levi, son of Alphaeus, sitting in his office. Jesus said to him, follow me. Levi got up and followed him. And the rest of the disciples said, you got to uh, be kidding. you got to be yeah. kidding. A yeah. tax collector and you're inviting him to join us? As a disciple. As a disciple? The people are really going to hate us now. <clears throat> well, they're going to they're gonna say what? This guy's loony. I mean, give up that kind of money, that kind of economic. Well, that would be that would be what the uh, maybe what the other fair. I mean, the tax collectors would say, right. but the rest of the people would say, why is he associating with this bunch of sinners? Right. What would well, be the equivalent today of calling a tax collector? To, to be, be a part to of be your, a part of your group, probably a prisoner, murderer, someone that's been convicted oh, of uh, yeah. a politician, yeah. or someone that's been convicted of uh, embezzlement. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Later on, Jesus was having a meal in Levi's house. The man was wealthy; he could throw a big banquet. A large number of tax collectors and other outcasts were following Jesus. And many of them joined him and his disciples at the table. Now, what, what do you think? You, you believe that you're following the man who's going to be the, the future king of Israel. He's going to conquer the world. And you're just waiting for him to do his thing. And you're on the, in the inside circle. You're going to be part of his cabinet or whatever like that, right? Hmm. And now, what kind of people is he gathering around him? Those hated publicans. Well, not only that, what, who else? Well, he had lepers and outcasts. And, uh, yeah. I mean, these well. guys are just, they have no schooling. Anything, anybody, but who they thought was important. Yeah. Some teachers of the law who were Pharisees saw that Jesus was eating with these outcasts and tax collectors, so they asked him, his disciples, why does he eat with such people? Now, the Pharisees and the Sadducees, well, especially the Pharisees now, have learned you don't question Jesus directly. <laughs> Why not? <laughs> you get wiped out. You get wiped out. <laughs> yeah, you don't collect. You. So now they try, they're trying to get at him to his disciples. So why does he eat with such people? Jesus heard them and answered, people who are well do not need a doctor, but only those who are sick. I have not come to call respectable people, but outcasts. And so, I mean, it, who do you expect me to call? Exactly, it's perfectly <laughs> obvious. I mean, if you're healing everybody, you 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 call you invite the sick, right? <clears throat> you know, it's his his answers are always so sensible and so logical. You you just you stand there with your mouth open. What what can you say? So what happens next? Well, we go to. Go on down, chapter 2. Look at starting, um, well, let's drop down. We're not going to talk about fasting for a moment. We're going to drop down to verse 23. Jesus was walking through some wheat fields on a Sabbath. As his disciples walked along with him, they began to pick the heads of wheat. So the disciples said to Jesus, Look, it is against our law for your disciples to do that on the Sabbath. Okay, let's, let's back up a second. Was what they were doing basically okay if they had done it on any other day of the week? What were they doing? They were eating to fulfill their... They were harvesting. Food. They were thrashing. They were, well, they were preparing a meal, quote, unquote, and they were eating yeah. on the Sabbath, right? This wasn't considered stealing the grain when they were no. walking through. Yeah. So they weren't accusing them of stealing grain. That was okay. The problem was it was on the Sabbath. They were doing a bunch, several different forms of work and they, he would, they were doing it on the Sabbath. And his commandments specifically forbade what? Working on the Sabbath, right? And there are, to, to make a very, how, to show how very strict this is in a modern setting, um, um, modern Jewish folk who are very strict this way, they won't even push a button on an elevator mm -hmm. on the Sabbath because it will make an electrical contact back there, a little spark, and that's fire, and that's a, you're not supposed to kindle a fire on the Sabbath. Not only that, you're causing a machine to work for you. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and I'm not trying to be critical of 
of those folk I'm just trying to illustrate here how in a modern yeah. setting how really strict they were about yeah. this. And perhaps the action yeah. of working <coughs> of actually pushing the button. But I heard uh, some folks would wait, hang out and just wait for a Gentile to come and then the gent let the Gentile push the yeah. button. Right. Well, Gentiles probably can't be saved anyway, so. I've experienced that. They still do it today, mm -hmm. Orthodox. Oh, yes. Yeah, would actually, you, yes. Would you turn the light off for me? Mm -hmm. Yeah, oh, yeah. Well, technically, in, in Jesus' day, you weren't even allowed to ask. <coughs> you just hoped they would see what you needed to have happen, and you would do it. Then you'd be concerned that you might have been too overt in your mm -hmm. expressing your desire. Yeah. In, in keeping the Sabbath, I find a lot of people want to help me to buy something I on see. the Sabbath. <laughs> I say, no, I don't, I don't buy anything or I keep the Sabbath. Well, that's okay. I'll, I'll buy it for you. Yeah. And I said, no, 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 it's not about that. You're misunderstanding. You know, it's if anyone buys it for me, it's I'm buying it. Well, in other words, if someone buys it for me and I caused that action, it's, it's the same thing as if I had bought it myself. Jesus mentions something. He talks about the time David was running. He went to the priest's place, and the priest gave him the bread that ordinary people weren't supposed to eat. And was that all right? Well, technically, no, it wasn't. But here's David doing it. And who's David? David is their great hero, right? He was the great king. So they would excuse what David did because it was David. Yes. I see. And it's in the scripture. It's in the Bible. How can you argue with that? And Jesus' conclusion is a very interesting one in verses 27 and 28. And Jesus concluded the Sabbath was made for the good of human beings. They were not made for the Sabbath. So the Son of Man is Lord even of the Sabbath. What does he say? Powerful. <coughs> As I made it. I made the Sabbath. I'll tell you how to run it. <laughs> I'll tell you how to worship on the Sabbath. That's right. <laughs> yeah. And it's and it's a present for us. So many people read this particular scripture and they go, oh, we don't need to keep the Sabbath. Mm -hmm. And I read it, I don't see what they're seeing there because it seems like God made the Sabbath as a gift mm -hmm. for us, not something that we should discard. Mm -hmm. Exactly. It's not above us, it's for us, it's mm -hmm. our present. So then how, how, how is it that Jesus, would Jesus normally not rub grain between, make a habit of going out and rubbing grain between his hands and eat the grain on Sabbath? Would no, he, would, he thought it was fine. He would think it, Jesus thought it was fine. He didn't have any problem with that. So there's just an every, just, just a, or, or was he in a desperate circumstance? Often I hear that's used as an argument here. Is that They were hungry. Yeah. In this that, case, that, you know, they had no food, mm -hmm. and, and so this was to, to well, feed them. But, but had they had any other circumstance, um, they would have made an, uh, uh, an effort to gather the grain other than on Sabbath. And yes, of course, yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, the question I have, <clears throat> would he wash dishes on Sabbath? I hope so. I had to do that for a whole year <laughs> in a boarding school. <laughs> All the dishes, three meals a day. Well, you must have been a naughty boy. No, <laughs> that was my, that was my, this was this boarding school. Everybody had to do a work, a job. You were not allowed to go to school there unless you worked. And that was what was assigned to me. But doesn't it also indicate that man is not a small cog in the large yeah. Sabbath machine? Mm -hmm. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So they had their, not, their lives turned up, turned tied up in knots trying to follow all their rules. And they were making rules to, to bypass the rules that they had made before about this and that. And they had all these crazy notions and Jesus says, forget all that nonsense. If people are hungry, you feed them on the Sabbath. If they want to pick grain, heads of grain and rub them in their hands or pull the cover, the, you know, the, the, the skin off and, and eat the grain, it's just fine. But they were not to do that and put it in their pocket no. and haul it away. No. But 
I wouldn't mind helping a, a, a you a you that was having a difficult lambing session. I'd help it out. If yeah. Donkey oh, yeah. fell in the yeah. pit, you'd go get it, but mm -hmm. not people. Mm -hmm. So, Ken, what have we learned about God through this portion well, of the life of Christ? We have touched the first <laughs> few months, maybe a month or so or two, of his ministry in Galilee. And he's getting ready to call the disciples when he will specifically teach them. But so far we've seen that Jesus has proved that he has authority over disease, he has authority over the elements, he has authority over fish in the sea, whatever all that implies, authority over nature. And he can forgive sins. And based on their understanding of things, that means what? That means you're a God. And there was no, I mean, there was no escaping the logic that everybody in Capernaum knew about that story, I'm sure within a few minutes, you know, or at least a day or so. Everybody knew about the story. There's no way you could escape it. And now we would say, well, a, a sickness is one thing and sin is something else. But in their way of thinking, there was no way around this. You have to believe that only God can heal that kind of a problem. And we would say probably the same thing today. A person is paralyzed, all four, you know, quadriplegic, and who's going who's gonna, to who's gonna heal this person? I can't help but be empathetic with, with them. Yeah. I mean, here is this man walking around, looks, looks very similar to all other men walking around. Uh, and, and how many of us have seen God? Yeah. Yeah. So that was a huge conundrum for them yeah. to unravel. Well, Jesus and he was doing all the things. He was busting apart their whole belief system. And so they, you know, it just irked them to no end. Yes. He, he met the people where they were. Yeah. And what they saw was that Jesus, if Jesus kept this up very soon, everybody would be following him and nobody would be following them. And this was a terrible problem. So we have seen that Jesus is into his ministry. He's into it a big way. And we're going to follow him through his time in Galilee and then on through the rest of his life. And we hope you'll be there with us when we do that next time and the times following. See you then.